Today is November 14th, 2020. My name is Gabriela Garza. I'm interviewing Micaela Lamas for the University Library Special Collections and Archives at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, here after abbreviated as UTRGV. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Micaela, that this interview will be placed in the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there's something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we will talk about it. The university's library special collections and archives will archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation you're willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright or non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials that you donate to special collections and archives at UTRGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we continue. Um, so I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. One, do you give university library special collections and archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV University Library? Yes, I agree. Two, do you grant UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials, uh, materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Three, do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Four, do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting the interview on the, this interview on the internet? Yes, I agree. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We use information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure VOSIS server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before VOSIS sends it, UTRGV special, uh, University Libraries, uh, before VOSIS sends it to UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives, we would have stripped any contact information for yourself or family members, so that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGV University Library. The final two questions ask for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish to, for us to share the rest of your interview in the public file, of it, uh, public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives? Yes, I agree. Uh, six, on occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and Voices receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I agree. Okay, thank you for your consent. Your experiences and story mean a lot to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you say in the interview questions I wanna ask. Okay. Um, Mickey, <laughs> first I just wanna thank you for taking your time. Your stories and experiences are valuable to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and the Voices Project. Particularly for us at UTRGV Special Collections, we're committed to preserving the stories of Mexican Americans and Latinos from South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley, and those who work closely with these populations during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you were the first person I thought of to interview because the Latinx experience is typically flattened in, in US public understanding to exclude Black Latinos. And aside from your personal experience with contracting COVID, your own understanding of your identity maturing as you have been away from the Valley at school for the past almost four years, and the knowledge of your family's experiences during the pandemic. You're also a student entering an unconventional workforce, uh, workforce with talent that you have worked hard to develop throughout your entire life. Um, I feel your stories and experiences are especially unique and, and meaningful as a sophisticated performer from the Valley. And 
thought it was important your perspective is included in this project that seeks to preserve stories of Latinx people from South Texas during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so uh, before I ask you to share stories about your life in the pandemic, um, will you tell us a little bit about Mickey Lamas? Go ahead and tell us about yourself. Yes. Okay. So hi, my name is Mikaela Lamas. I go by Mickey most of the time. I'm 21 years old. I'm about to graduate um, college at Texas State University um, with my BFA in musical theater in May. Um, I have been singing all my life, basically since I was three, but I didn't start theater until I was a junior in high school. And then I got into the Texas State Musical Theater Program, um, which was like basically kind of the turning point in my life and kind of pushed me to do this in the first place. Um, I have a single mom, her name is Stephanie Lamas. I've lived with her and my two grandparents, Norma Lamas and Silverio Lamas my entire life, and my um, Thea. Andrea Lamas. Um, I grew up with them. We all lived in the same house. Uh, I don't have any siblings. Um, I also do film and I also write a lot, but I just started getting into that and directing and all of that. But musical theater is my main ish and I'm eventually going to move to New York sometime in July to start um, planning the rest of my life there. So that's just a little bit about me. Awesome. Um... So the first question I want to ask you is, when did you first hear about COVID-19 um, and how did you first learn about it? I, it was, I think it was back in January when I was watching the news. So I wasn't watching the news, I was on my phone. I was keeping up to date because I get, you know, the like New York Times um, updates sent to my phone. And it was talking about how it was spreading a lot. Um, there was no, how there was like a case zero in Chicago or somewhere like that. Um, which was kind of unsettling because at first we didn't really think that this was going to get this bad, obviously. And I was here at school, um, here in my, I think it was my acting for film class, when my class of 14, there's 14 people in my current senior class, um, heard about it. And we were talking about it and just discussing how it, it wasn't going to end up as bad as we as bad as we were anticipating obviously be naive and then later on when it started getting worse i remember um one of my peers she was a senior at the time because i was a junior and she was talking about how michigan musical theater the music the michigan musical theater program was gonna cancel their showcase and showcase is basically this huge thing that we do in new york where we um showcase um like our greatest hits kind of in front of agents and stuff and a lot of good musical theater programs do that in order to kind of push us into the industry before we move to new york and they had canceled their showcase which is obviously a huge deal because showcase is the thing that helps you get started um and we were kind of like oh that's not gonna happen to us but obviously um <laughs> that was pretty naive, but I wasn't a senior then, so it happened to our current, our past senior class last year, which is unfortunate, but that was kind of around the first time that I heard about it, right before it kind of made everything, uh, hell, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, so at what point did you, sorry, I'm trying to, this pop let me take like a, a brief aside just because uh, just I want to acknowledge this will be edited out. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that some of these are going to be like, um, like redundant. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally fine. I'm trying to like not like go too into detail for each question because I know that's probably going to be asked later. Yeah, because I was going to ask like, what was your first reaction to the information, but you covered that. And so that yeah, was like, at what point did you realize this pandemic was a serious life? um altering event but i think that kind of covered it too so mm -hmm. i'm like okay okay so yeah fourth i can make them sh i can also make them shorter i was yeah. gonna ask that, but... no, that, was, that was great so i feel i feel like that that makes my job easier too <laughs> yeah okay awesome I, I'm, I might just get like quiet for a second like trying to figure out like which question that's fine that's okay. fine um so over the last few months uh what news media, social media, or other sources do you rely on to keep you informed about coronavirus? So I do a lot of just <laughs> Google searching, but I started um, 
like last year, getting updates from like the New York Times news app. Um, I don't really watch the news because I never really had the time to watch the news. Now I do, obviously. But um, I also keep up to date on Twitter and stuff, you know, the little news page on there. I try to look for reliable sources. I go on the CDC website and look at um, updates on each state and like restrictions and stuff. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, can you share with me what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease? What do you mean? Um, like what's your, or what's your basic understanding of the way that like COVID functions as a disease? Like the thing uh, Okay, so I know that COVID affects your respiratory system and that's why a lot of people lose their sense of smell and sense of taste and stuff like that and why people end up um dying due to um things that happen with their lungs and i know it's a lot of like the after effects of covid that end up uh deadly when it comes to um catching the virus I don't know, I mean, I guess nobody really does know specifically how it attacks different people, because I know some people can get it twice, some people can't, some people can get antibodies, some people can't. Um, but I do know that like once it's in your system, we don't know how long it stays there, even if you test negative twice, because um, it can still uh, give you lasting health problems. And it also affects um, people differently with age. So um, 75 and up, I think, or is it 50 to 75, are more prone to uh, worse situations or worse side effects from, or worse effects from the disease. Whereas like younger people tend to get mild cases, but that wasn't proven to be exactly right because some younger people have died from the disease as well. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, can you share with me what you don't understand about the new coronavirus? I don't understand how how it's like causing people, especially young people, to like go into cardiac arrest and give them heart attacks because you'd think like it's a respiratory disease, yeah. But I don't think that's just what it is. It's just kind of confusing about how it attacks certain things, and you really don't know what's going on in your body once you have it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, would you take the first COVID-19 vaccine available on the market and why or why not? Yes, I would. And I think um, only if, you know, wh whoever got it before me doesn't grow a third arm, but um, I would take it because if it's, you know, FDA approved, blah, 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 blah. Does that make sense? Yes. That's that's how it works, I think. Um, <laughs> it's like uh, gone through trials and all of that, and it's proven to be safe. Then I would totally take it because I wouldn't want to risk giving it to anybody else or getting it again. Um, it's mostly for me. It's mostly like I wouldn't want to give that to anybody else, and I would want things to open back up again and um, live go back to living closer to a normal life. Mm -hmm. Um, do you, do your family hold the same beliefs about uh, as you about COVID nineteen, or are there some members who take it more seriously or lightly? Um, yeah, my family holds the same, but my grandparents are obviously way more cautious because my grandma um, is immunocompromised, and so is my my um, Thea because my Thea has um, MS, and my Grandma's currently going through like treatments of chemo, so she would she's especially since she's older too. She's in her sixties. It would um, probably not be good if she got it. Uh, same with my grandpa, even though he's like healthy and he tries to keep healthy, he's still older, so you never know. Um, my mom is the same, but she has to go to work, which sucks, and she works in a hospital, so she has to um, be really really safe. They all have to be safe around my tia and my grandma. I. I'm not living there in the valley. I'm currently in San Marcos in an apartment with other people my age. So we're obviously cautious and we wear masks and um, we try to stay in a bubble. We try not to go out to bars or anything. Um, but we aren't as cooped up as we were a few months ago. Yeah, that's a great segue because um, 
uh, like I mentioned before we started the interview for this next set of questions, I want to ask <laughs> you about your personal experience as a student um, and just the general effects of COVID. So uh, will you share a little bit about what the past eight months have been like for um, you, your family, and then also uh, your pod? Yeah. Your okay. So I, when Corona hit, I went back home and I stayed with my family for about, I think it was three months and I was just there. I didn't go anywhere because I didn't want to, because I didn't want to get it. And I also didn't want to give it to my grandma or anything. If I have to get it, I didn't, we didn't even go to the grocery store. We ordered in everything, ordered groceries, um, uh, maybe go through a drive through but then as soon as we got back to my house, this is in the valley, I live in Mission, Texas, originally, um, we would have to go into the house and take off our shoes and spray everything down with hand sanitizer and then go into the shower and then come back out to eat and stuff. But then when I moved back up here, um, COVID was doing, I mean, it wasn't doing great, but it wasn't spiked like it was at first in San Marcos. So I was in my apartment and I was just with uh, five other friends who were here during quarantine and they all lived in their apartments, in separate apartments, but none of us really went out uh, to like grocery stores or anything because we had that general rule, but some of them still went to the gym and then that's how we ended up getting it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um. So how did you finish the school year? Um, will you talk a little bit about how your performance-based curriculum was affected? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I remember <laughs> the day that I found out that we weren't going to have school for like two weeks after spring break, uh, Texas State kind of did this thing where they kind of let us off easily. They didn't tell us, hey, we're taking the rest of the year um, online and next semester they kind of like eased into it so at first they were like we're just gonna have two weeks after spring break then we're gonna tell you guys if we're coming back or not and we're probably gonna come back and then we didn't um but the day that i found out that we were taking those two weeks off i was in um in a full run of guys and dolls which is a musical i wasn't in the musical because i had an audition that semester because i was deciding to take the semester off so i could get a job um um and then I watched the full run and that production was going to be one of the best musicals we were going to do at Texas State University. And I'm glad that I got to see that run because that was the final time that cast ever met up with each other or ever did anything on that musical again. Um, cause that night they sent out, no, the next day they sent out a message that we were going to return to school for two weeks. And I remember that night sitting with some of my friends on our balcony and we were like, we're going to come back. Like we are, we're going to come back in April. It's going to be fine. Um, but I knew, like, in my gut, something was telling me that that was not going to happen. And then slowly, as we were at home for those two weeks after spring break, um, Caitlin Hopkins, who's the head of our musical theater program, she called us and said, hey, showcase is going to be canceled to the seniors. I was a junior then, and that obviously hit so hard, because that is one of the most important things we do here. So everyone was really, really, really sad and obviously had to also cancel guys and dolls they really tried to make it work but she decided that wasn't safe which is really smart um which was also really sad because that was going to be some of the seniors last show here and some of like the freshmen's like first show um at texas state so all of us were kind of just in a run and we decided that we were going to be going into school online over zoom um so yeah that's kind of how it affected it and the last eight months i've just been on zoom so i do my voice lessons over zoom i do my bfa class over zoom currently i'm a senior so we're planning our senior showcase so we're planning hopefully in may <laughs> that um we get to actually do an in-person showcase at pearl studios in new york city but we're not counting on it so instead we're we're, we're going to record it just in case because my entire class is here in texas we decided to all come back and just stay here so at least like we could have each other for our last year so that's just been how school has been going um what was it like to begin the school year again after it became clear that COVID restrictions, uh, what affect your senior year more than, than you originally anticipated? Like you talked about it a little bit just now, but kind of mm -hmm. what was that like, I guess, emotionally for y'all, for you and then for your cohort? 
it was so weird because it didn't feel it, it was a ter not a terrible it felt like such an weird transition from junior year to senior year because usually when you're a musical theater major and like you're about to be senior like the beginning of the year you have like a little party and you're like yeah we're gonna be seniors like let's like let's kick some ass this year because it's our last year here and we're gonna go and graduate and move to new york after and we're never like really gonna see any of like the acting majors or like uh pmps or like anyone else um for a while because you know once you move to new york like you kind of do your own thing for a little bit and you're busy trying to like book and everything like that um so it was weird because it just felt like a eight month summer because and it still feels like that because we're not technically seeing each other i mean we are my class but we're not in class together and we can't really see caitlin or um any of our faculty in person and the last time i saw my voice teacher in person was so, like a year ago because um we switch off each semester so like michael Mareska is for usually my first semester voice teacher and then um marquis Mareska, who's his wife is my second semester voice um teacher so i haven't seen michael in like over a year now and marquee in like nine months so it's really really weird or we haven't seen our dance teacher we're taking dance over zoom um it's just a really weird transition because you want to feel like it's your last year and you want to like let go of junior year but for some reason we still can't because it didn't really feel like it ever stopped it just kept going it just kind of halted mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel like we had a smooth transition because half of our junior year was taken away and half of our senior year was taken away so it all just feels like one clump Mm -hmm. and uh, and my classmates could really agree with that because when we got here we were like we don't feel like seniors because we were just juniors and we we didn't get to like close that chapter so that kind of sucked but we're adapting definitely um what was it like to come back to the valley to come back to mission when you visited during the summer and uh, how many times did you end up visiting <clears throat> i I think I've I've been there twice now. So the first time was when I stayed there for three months. Uh and the first time was not good. Not because not because of the valley, but just because like I um I mean I I moved for a reason. Like I, I moved over here, I got an apartment in San Marcos to go to school over here because I wanted to get out of the valley and not saying that the valley's bad or anything. I just like there's no place for me over there for what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Um and I'm lucky that my school is still in Texas because I have the privilege of um, getting to like drive back and forth, even though it's four hours. Um, whereas like my classmates are all from out of state. So they're from California, Virginia, New York, places like that. There's only about like four people in my program who are from actual Texas. Everyone else is from out of state. Mm -hmm. So they have to fly. So they either had to choose to like stay home or come back and just stay in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, but visiting Mission was really, really incredibly depressing when I was first there for three months because I wasn't doing anything. I was just cooped up in my room, um, wishing that I was doing things. Uh, and although I loved like seeing my family, of course, like when you're out of the house and when you're living somewhere else, you get used to that. And it's kind of just, it feels like, it feels so odd and like redundant to like live back at home again. Cause it's kind of like, I didn't escape that. I just like not doing that anymore. So it, it was really weird going back and just living there. And I love spending time with my family, but it was just really depressing and caused me to really go into like a depressive episode because I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I just had to stay at home and kind of wait. Mm -hmm. And plus on top of that, like there's so, there was so much, there's still so much death going on around us in the world. And that especially sucks because you don't want to, like, it sucks that that's happening. You don't want people to die, <laughs> um, like, every day, and especially in Texas because it's not being taken care of properly um, by our governor. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was just really, really, really sad just being there. I felt really lonely because I didn't have any of my friends. Um, yeah. And I the second time I went was... I think it was it was about a month and a half ago maybe or a month ago I was there just for a little bit because I just wanted to take a break 
from being here because I realized after a while being here alone wasn't too great because all of my class wasn't back yet. So I went back home just to, just to be with my mom and my grandparents just to see them. And that was even worse. <laughs> and I don't know why, but it, so I was just anxious all the time when I was at home because I also had to do school online. And um, it was just a really, really rough time. And I don't know why. I do know why, like, there's a pandemic going on, and, like, the that's, like, traumatic t to all of us. Like, even if you're not being directly affected by it, you're still affected by it in some way, because, uh, like, it just sucks to see people dying because of this, because it's not taken care of properly, and, um, you, I mean, social interaction is one of the things that, like, keeps me going, and, because I'm a huge extrovert, so my tank really runs out when I'm alone for too long instead of like compared to someone who's an introvert who like their tank really runs out when they're with other people it's like reverse that for me so the situation was not good um but i came back and now i'm here and i've been here and i feel i'm feeling pretty comfortable because now my entire class is here and we see each other at least i get to see them um but yeah that's been how that has gone <laughs> yeah and remind us really quick how big is your class my class is 14 people, uh, for the exception of one, her name is Lily Kren, she uh, stayed in Florida because she wanted to, she needs, she needed to like make money over there instead of coming back to Texas, um, uh, which is really sad because I haven't seen her in almost a year now. And she's one of my best friends, everyone in my class. We're all like siblings because, I mean, you put 14 people into a class and you take every single class together because we're all musical theater majors. Um, so you, you're siblings by the time you're seniors. So at least I get to see them. Um, yeah. Um, so s since in both the Valley and San Marcos, you're living with, you live with other people. Um, do, do you feel the need to self quarantine after traveling or how was that, um, you know, traveling and that kind of thing handled? So I didn't feel the need to self quarantine because I would stay here and I wouldn't go anywhere, not even like grocery stores or really outside before my mom would pick me up. So I'd stay indoors for about two weeks or a week before my mom would come and then she would come and pick me up and drive me. So it was just me and her directly to my house. So I, I wasn't really exposed to anywhere because I was just with my mom. Um, and then I would go to my house and just kind of chill there. And then the same thing would happen when I would come back. I don't fly or anything. My mom just drives me. Um, how would you compare the difference in COVID responses in San Marcos versus in the Valley? Just I guess, based on your observations. <laughs> um, <laughs> so at first in San Marcos, it was a little better than the valley because especially nightlife um i saw like a couple days ago this video of people i think it was on 17th street in mccallan in the valley and none of them were really wearing masks mm -hmm. um compared to here where i still see people going out but i see them with masks at least whatever but <laughs> um a lot of people do more like outside dining and outside um drinking um, and there's more social distancing enforced here. Um, uh, pe like, people will get kicked out if they're not wearing a mask. Um, so I don't think it's, I mean, I think Texas as a whole has been a, a huge problem. Um, but there definitely was a difference um, between here and the valley, because I know when the valley had that huge spike, I was here. Um, and I just think that now it's just getting progressively a little worse. And that's probably why we're going into a second um, lockdown. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions now about just your family. Um, so, and like um, employment, in your family's employment. So um, to start with, uh, what does your mom do? And how has her job been affected by COVID? You mentioned earlier that she um, has still continued to work. Mm -hmm. So she's a referral specialist at, I think it's, well, it's I'm a terrible daughter. I don't know where it is. I think it's in Edinburgh. I think it's Edinburgh Hospital. She moves around a lot, um, but she's a referral specialist. Um, and so at first her hours were really getting cut. So she wasn't making um, the same amount of money 
um, she already doesn't make too much money. Um, so we were already a little, like struggling a little bit. Um, so her hours were getting cut and she was coming home earlier. And then I think like three weeks ago, their system or something got hacked. It wasn't COVID related, but, um, so they had to stay at home for a little bit. So she had to work from home, like over, over, so she would like manage the phone at home. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did I answer all that question? Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> What about your grandparents? How are their, are they employed and how are their jobs affected? So my grandma's not employed. I actually don't really know how this works. She gets, um, does she still get paid? I don't, <laughs> I literally don't know, but my grandpa's a teacher at La Jolla, um, I think middle school. Yeah, it's middle school. So he had a lot of Zoom meetings um at home when i was there so he would like do class and stuff and he would have meetings with teachers um but yeah what about um you have an aunt who is now who just recently moved to california um, mm -hmm. out of your family home um, yes where is she living and how has her employment been affected yeah okay so yeah i forgot to mention so i grew up in a house of one, two, three, four, five, five other people. So it was my mom, my two grandparents, and my two tias. One of them, so one with MS, who's still living there, and then my other is my tia Amanda, who is now in California. And she, at first, was working at when she went to California. I think she was working at like a roller rink, which was really cool. And she tried to get a job. Um, what does she do? I think she's. Hmm. <laughs> I need to ask uh, more about my family, I guess. Um, yep. But she's currently um, just in California. She's going to work at a dispensary soon, mm -hmm. um, which is really cool, um, in my opinion. <laughs> and um, yeah, she's she's definitely hustling. I just don't know exactly what it is, but she used to be a teacher um, at La Jolla before she moved. Um, what differences do you notice in the way that she describes COVID responses in California, where she is, uh, versus here? So, in California, it's being handled a little better, apparently, because she's also, like, everyone there is wearing their mask re regularly. It's kind of like a, you, you will get shamed if you're not wearing one, like, you know, like, everyone will kind of look at you weird if you're not over there in California, whereas here, like, it's not so much that. Um, but she's just been telling me that she's been, like, staying indoors and, like, people are really taking precaution, even though cases are rising over there still. Um, but those are, like, the main differences that I've noticed that whenever I have a conversation with her. I haven't talked to her in, in a while, but, yeah. Wait, um, and do you mind mentioning what, uh, what city or what area in California she's in? She's... Mm, I think she's in Fresno. Okay. Don't quote uh, me on that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, and so you also mentioned that you one of your tias has MS. Um, mm -hmm. you, would you care? Or would you uh, like to like briefly describe what MS is? Uh, yes. And how your grandparents' care for her has been affected. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she has MS, multiple sclerosis, which is. Um, I mean, it basically made her legs stop working when she was about 16. I don't know specifically how it attacks, like, the nervous system, but um, it, it affects different people differently. There's no cure currently, um, so that's been troubling because it progresses. It gets worse with time, so at first it was just her legs, and she had full mobility with her arms, and she could still kind of walk with, like, a walker, then eventually she couldn't do that anymore, and um she used to be able to like have proper speech but now she can't really talk um much and it it's affects her arm so she's kind of she can still move her arms but she doesn't have control over them really um 
so she's kind of like bedridden at the moment she used to go around in a wheelchair she used to be able to push herself but now she can't um but my grandparents have been taking care of her since since it's been happening so she's been living with them um and sometimes they would like put her in a in a home if they needed to like go somewhere sometimes my mom would take care of her or me and my mom but um my grandparents really have sacrificed so much for her um and really helped her even though they're they are getting older now um but yeah that's basically been how that's going mm-hmm. um so now i'm going to ask you a little bit about um you mentioned that you contracted covid <laughs> um, <laughs> what is that like and just to start uh when did it happen and uh if you want to reiterate how it happened you, you yes at the beginning Okay, so like I said, when I was like quarantining here with um, my five friends, um, if I accidentally name them, can you bleep it? <laughs> um, I think so. so or like cut so, it out. So, I, 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 I won't name them. Okay. But <laughs> it was just five of my friends. That it was five of my close friends and we were quarantined here. And um, uh we were all be we are we all were really trying to be cautious. We weren't going to grocery stores. If we went anywhere, it was with a mask. Um, even if we like went for outside walks, and we all decided that all of us were safe since we had been here for at least three weeks and none of us had caught anything. Um, so we were all just hanging out together because we were all really lonely because it was like either two people from one apartment of four, um, so it was just them two, or like I was alone in my apartment and it was just terrible because none of my roommates were back. Um, a lot of the, a lot of us were just alone and we were like, let's all like, we can all hang out with each other and that's it. Like we can't see anyone else. Um, but, uh, I caught it back in July. It was like middle of July. It was like July, it was early July. It's like July 9th through 10th. I think that's when I probably caught it, but, um, we would all hang out and then like, um, a couple of them, like, went to the gym, like, a couple times, and they really, really <laughs> tried to be safe. They would come home, they would take out their clothes, they would shower, and which just proves, like, no matter how careful you are, you'll still get it, because they would wear a mask, they would do everything they could. Um, so that's what we're thinking happened, because also what could be very possible is one of us, like, got it from, like, a door handle or, like, an elevator button or something. Um, but... Two of them had it at first, and then eventually we, like, most of us tested positive, except for, um, uh, like, one other person who we would hang out with, um, who didn't end up catching it surprisingly, but, um, it was really, really mild, which we were grateful for, because we went to the doctor and we got tested, and he told us, like, it's okay if you guys still see each other since you all have it, but, um, you're gonna be fine so we were like okay that makes us feel better we all of us just ended up having a loss of taste and smell um that was pretty much it i i felt like i had allergies like kind of bad allergies but i didn't have any breathing problems none of us really did maybe like two of them like had had a fever like for one day but then it went away and then we all just stayed home we wanted to see each other. We did at first for like a day and then we were all like, let's just um, check up on each other, like call each other to make sure like none of us are really having any problems, but let's just stay home and just kind of relax and disinfect our apartments so we don't go anywhere because we don't, we don't want to give it to anybody else. That would be terrible. And we don't want to like touch things in public and then someone that we don't know get it. We just didn't want to keep that spread going. So we all just decided to quarantine in t- for two weeks alone. Um, so... Um, we all stayed apart for two weeks, and then eventually our taste and smell started coming back, and then, um, we were released to, like, uh, go out in public and do other stuff after two weeks by the doctor that, um, tested us, um, here in San Marcos, so we eventually all got better, and then we tested negative, and, yeah, we survived, thank God. <laughs> uh, how long did it take to recover? Um, for me, it only took about seven days until my taste and smell were finally coming back, but I obviously wanted to wait two weeks because you should. Um, and then by the end of those two weeks, I wasn't really feeling weird anymore. And that's when I realized that it did have a little more effect than I thought because at first, 
my body was feeling a little weird and then after those two weeks were up I felt back to normal and my taste and smell came back and it's weird because sometimes things still taste a little faint and then it'll come back it's really really odd but my doctor said that that would happen that some people it permanently affects that um but I'm back to normal now and have tested negative so that's good <laughs> Uh, speaking of, um, you know, still having issues with your sense of taste and smell, mm -hmm. um, have you noticed any other long-lasting health effects? And have your friends noticed any? My friends, at first, um, realized that, like, when we would, like, work out and stuff or, like, do physical activity, that we couldn't, that we would lose our breath a little quicker and... Uh, most of us, since we're musical theater majors, we were really cautious of like what we eat and um, how we keep ourselves active. Um, even though now I'm pretty lazy, cause but um, uh, we noticed that, and I also noticed that I'm extremely hyper aware of every single feeling in my body, especially my nerves. So if I have like little twinges in like my chest or something, I'll notice it right away. Whereas like before pre-covid i would i would just brush it off but now it like scares me because i'm scared that it's something that's happened after knock on glass save your ass um but um i don't there hasn't been anything significantly different that i've noticed after um except for like maybe like sometimes taste or like something that is supposed to smell stronger is a little faint but um other than that i think it just made me more hyper aware of, of what my body's feeling Mm -hmm. um, is there any concern amongst you and your your friends that uh, contracted COVID at the same time? Is there any concern that it will affect your ability to perform on stage? Yes, we at first really thought because it can really affect singers be, by um, giving you lung problems. Mm -hmm. um, we were scared that that was going to happen, but it didn't, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still, so, we're obviously still always going to be scared until we get that vaccine or um, whatever it is that it might have done something to our body that we don't really know about, like underlying problems. Because I remember I got a checkup like about a month ago, and this was after I tested negative. Um, and like I had like low liver enzymes and not enough vitamin D, not enough vitamin C. And usually that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So I had to start taking vitamins again and I feel better. But I realized that it probably did have more of an effect on my body than it did. Um, and that's not a good thing for performing because if you can't do anything, then you can't perform on stage. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really a big concern. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing about... Um, about COVID and about your your life and your background um, mm -hmm. is uh, I was hoping we can move on to talk a little bit um, more about your grandparents and your grandma's cancer diagnosis and treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to start uh, for some background, um, you kind of already uh, addressed this and I'll probably ask different iterations of this um, a couple more times, but uh, can you describe what it was like to grow up in the valley with them? Um, okay, growing up in the valley was great with my grandparents because I had them as like a support system. Like usually people have their two parents and if your mom says no, you go to your dad so he can say yes. But um, uh, I've had my grandparents for that. So my grandpa's like a father figure and my grandma's like another mom. So whenever I was like little, my mom was being, um, would not cooperate with me. I'd go to my grandparents and then they'd baby me because that's how grandparents be. But um Growing up with them was great. I really, pre I'm really thankful that I had them in my life, and I was that close to them. Because a lot of people aren't as close to their grandparents because their grandparents aren't as young as mine, um, or they're just not as close to them because they don't live with them. But I lived with them, so I've created like an attachment to them, of course. So yeah, that that was great. Yeah, that's a really great description. Um, and you mentioned that they're supportive of your of you and like like that they're your support system and and um that they're supportive of your kind of your career goals um i know you mm -hmm. have some you know just stories about how they've been very supportive since the very beginning and i was wondering if you'd like to share one of those mm -hmm. so my um 
grandma was like the first person who found out that I could kind of sing. Well, I would I would sing a lot, but I didn't start sounding like I could sing until I was about like four. Um, my grandma has a story where like her she used to have a, a close friend that worked at my elementary. I went to Bryan Elementary, and um, I had gotten cast as Ariel in The Little Mermaid, like a little tiny musical that my kindergarten class had and that was like my first one ever um and I we were like practicing after school and I was singing one of the Ariel songs and my grandma was coming to pick me up and she was in the front office and she overheard like you know me singing to the microphone and she asked her friend who worked at the front office she was like oh my god who is that little girl singing she's amazing and the lady went and like checked and she was like that's your granddaughter and she was like my granddaughter and she comes in and she was like what <laughs> which I think is all such a funny story and I remember when I performed that that um, Little Mermaid that's when my mom kind of figured out too and my mom and my grandma were in the audience and they were like where is this coming from and that's kind of how that happened um, and my grandpa's always been like proud of me whenever I do anything like with choir when I started with choir or theater and I've been really lucky to have that as like my mom and my grandparents are all so supportive of it because you don't see that a lot especially with um, Latinx families are like uh uh black families either even though my my mom's side is they're white um hispanic but yeah uh they've always been supportive because they always believed that i could do it that's really beautiful thank you very much <laughs> um so now moving on to like the less uh the more like somber question um how did you find out about your grandma's cancer diagnosis and what was that moment like so <laughs> my mom called me just to kind of tell me she was kind of making it seem as if it was a big deal she was like so your grandma fell and landed on her head and she was too much to the doctor just get it checked and she has a brain tumor and, and i was like <laughs> what and that was really I don't know. I, um, it, it was really weird because my family, like, obviously, like, we're really emotional, and I'm a really emotional person until I have to be emotional. So when that happened, I was kind of like, okay, because I'm more of, like, a kind of brush under the rug until something actually happens. So lately, it's just been really weird, like, my feelings towards that because obviously I'm sad, but it's so deep that I'm not feeling it. <laughs> not that I'm not feeling it, but it's not um, coming out, really. It's just kind of like you're kind of like... It's kind of like I'm grieving something that hasn't even happened. And I don't want that to actually happen. Um, but yeah, I just... I was... I reacted very just... I didn't really know what to say because, I mean, there's nothing we could really do about it. But like, wait... So that's just been weird because my emotional response to it has been so odd. Because usually I respond really outwardly, but this time it's been so inward. And I've been keeping everything in a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a really it's a really hard thing to deal with. Mm -hmm. Where is she re receiving treatment? And how frequently does she travel for treatment? Um, she goes to Houston. I don't know specifically what um, hospital it is. But I haven't been keeping track of how much they go because they don't keep me up to date with it because they don't want to, like, scare me or anything. But she just went back, I think, a few days ago. Um, and my grandpa takes her. So she's been she's been there a couple times um, because now she's on, like, a more aggressive uh, treatment. Hopefully that'll, like, destroy it because at first it was going away and it did. But there was just a little trace of it still. So they, they wanted to make sure that they kill all of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what's currently happening. Um, how has, um, you know, having to travel and receive this treatment in a pandemic kind of affected um, the way that she, I don't know, just the way that they are navigating that whole journey then of getting oncology treatment? Yeah, so it's been a little scary for them because they obviously don't want to catch anything while they're going, but they're being as safe as they can. Um, uh, like, you know, wearing their masks and always sanitizing and stuff. And of course, it's been harder now that this is going on because she can't just receive that treatment in the valley. She has to go to Houston for it and they have to travel, but they drive. So at least there's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. I know that's really, um, it's a really difficult topic. So I really appreciate uh, you just describing it a little bit for 
for us to to preserve and kind of mm -hmm. remember of course. something that's happening right now. Um, so now we're going to move on to a couple of questions um, about the protests this summer and ethnic identity. Um, so let's circle back to what growing up in the valley was like for you. Um, how how did you view your ethnic identity and your relationships to uh, your peers growing up and, and to your family? Mm -hmm. So growing up, I, I, I mean, obviously I've always known that I was, um, I'm half black and half white, but I, my ethnicity is Hispanic. Um, and my mom always tried to make me proud of that. But of course, growing up in front, like around just everyone being white Hispanic, um, of course it's like, it's, there's a lot of like self resentment and stuff. And, um, especially with like how society treats black people, even though I am, pri I, I do still have that white privilege because, um, of, you know, colorism and terrible things like that. Um, it was still hard uh, because I didn't want to accept the fact that I was black growing up. And obviously now I love that about myself. Like, I think that that's one of the most important parts of my identity, but not growing up with a lot of black friends or anything like that really, really confused me because I just identified with, uh, um, my white Latino side because that's all I really knew even though my mom really tried really really tried to make, help me embrace both of them but she can't really do much because she's she's white <laughs> um but that was really interesting because there's also a lot of like racism in the valley and um just like inherently and my hair always looked different it was always like bigger and wasn't straight and I always wanted it straight um, just like that self-deprecating kind of thing that happens when you, when people, or you, the, your friends or the people around you don't really teach you how to love yourself. Um, but my mom and my grandparents really helped me do that as I got older. And of course now, like now that I'm not there anymore, I've embraced it so much more because now I have friends that are different looking and are diverse and aren't just that, which there's nothing, obviously nothing wrong with that, but it's hard when you're just growing up around one certain type of person and there's not much uh, diversity around you. Yeah, absolutely. My next question actually was going to be, um, how has it changed since leaving the Valley and uh, how have your beliefs changed? So I obviously love my skin and I <laughs> love um, my, the fact that I am biracial. Um, uh, and there's, of course, there's always like that ingrained like self-hate that tells you what to think about yourself or what to think about other people, but I've learned to just ignore that and completely embrace that and my black and both my Hispanic identity. Um, and now I have actual black friends, which is so sad to say, but it's true and they've really helped me too because I share some of the same like problems with them growing up because um, some of them are biracial too and grew up in only like white Latino communities also as well, like either in New York or um, somewhere else. Um, so we've all come together and kind of like have taken a hold of like our black identities, our black side, um, which is really cool because I like getting to know about, know more about myself every day uh, and I learn more about it and um, it also helps me, you know, advocate for other other people that are going through the same thing or um yeah it's just taught me a lot of respect for the black community and the hispanic community mm -hmm. and um it's also just like opened up my eyes to how like how i identify and um the privileges that i have and everything like that too mm -hmm. yeah how, how how do you think sorry let me reset for a second um, <laughs> how do you think your understanding of your identity has been affected by experiencing uh, this phase of maturing into, under, into your understanding of yourself under Trump's presidency, because if you're going to graduate um, in the spring, then you've been probably, I guess, all of, most of the time you've been in college has been under his presidency, so Whoa. really coincided <laughs> with uh, that departure from the Valley, right? Mm -hmm. So I, um, before I go into that, I like completely understand my privilege as a bi biracial woman. Um, um, but it's still, 
God, well, it sucks. <laughs> it completely sucks because Trump's so, so very obviously racist, even though people like to um, deflect that. Um, and seeing my friends, my dark skinned black friends, affected by that completely, and about, uh, you know, police brutality and stuff like that, and how, you know, we can all agree that Trump's kind of aided in that by, you know, letting other people hate so outwardly by him being president because everyone thought I was okay. Um, that sucks. And in college, I'm surrounded by the most liberal arts program here, so there wasn't much that was that I was affected by in my little circle, but then once you go out of it and you're going to regular classes and you have debates with Trump supporters, you then realize they're very much still um, existing in your community and in your university. Um, um, so that sucks. It sucked. Um, and there's still a lot of work to do now that, um, Biden is about to be president. That doesn't mean that he's perfect because he's not, but, um, it's a step forward from that. Uh, I, I definitely will say though, like, I, I didn't realize how racist some things were in the Valley until I got to college and until I learned, oh, hey, that's actually pretty microaggressive or that's actually pretty racist if someone you know said the n-word who wasn't black and they just expect you to be okay with it because you were their friend or whatever like that um and i i think it's i think it's valuable to like learn and forgive if someone is willing to change um but that's like one of the big things i've learned and of course like i, I attended um, a lot of black lives matter protests in austin a couple months ago which going into that was so emotional and so disheartening because um, APD uh, are the worst and uh, I was tear gassed and you know shot at and stuff like that blah 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 it was just casual but um, those protests really opened my eyes even more and made me want to um, stand up for my community even more especially while Trump was president during all of that going on and the pandemic on top of that, which is horrifying. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You seem to be like one step ahead of me. Um, maybe I just, you know, formatted the flow with, with, really with you in mind, you know, but uh, I was going to, my next question was gonna be about how you pro uh, attended some protests in Austin over the summer. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we can start, you know, since you've already given us, uh, you've talked about it a little bit already. Um, is there, are there any other things you want to add to describe your motivation for participating? Um, I think it's also just seeing my friends and um, people there at the protests who were affected by all of that. Uh, I mean, it sucks because you, you learn compassion and empathy through experiences but it shouldn't always be that way i think you should always be empathetic towards people no matter if it affects you or not um because if it's a problem then it's a problem it's just point blank um but it's it i will say that it still did like going to those protests just made me open my eyes and it it, it it lets you know that it's very very real and until it like happens to you you don't fully understand which does suck and which i wish didn't happen but um yeah those protests were just really i don't know just really eye-opening and just made me realize that i um need to always be there for my black friends and um poc friends and uh we just all need to be more compassionate with each other, especially because our system is letting us down. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what were the protests themselves like? Um, would you mind describing, like, I don't know, if you have any stories or just kind of what the general experience is like? Yeah, they were pretty peaceful, which was why it was so infuriating when we were shot at and tear gassed by just standing on the street. We weren't really blocking traffic. Um, they would just do it for some, for no reason, and I like was pushed by a couple of police officers, and I wasn't doing anything. I was just trying to defend this girl who was on the floor trying to get up, who they were trying to arrest for doing nothing. Um, 
But it made me realize that they are really just so aggressive for no reason. And not to try to paint anyone that way, but it's it's true. And I've obviously made it very clear of like where I stand with that. Um, um, but it, it just really made me realize that like, the, 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 like boys can be so, so aggressive. And it's really disheartening because it's like, aren't you supposed to protect us? You're not supposed to make the problem even worse like when it, this shouldn't feel like a war and it felt like a war when i was there mm-hmm. um how did uh the pandemic inform your decision to protest so uh, i th- it was really hard because i wanted to go to these protests so bad and i did but i tried to be safe i tried to keep my distance um i wore a mask the entire time and a bandana over the mask, um, but, uh, it definitely made me second guess my choices, but for what it was, it's a really tricky question, because no, it wasn't really responsible to, like, being crowds like that, but, um, there was kind of, like, a, a revolution going on, so, um, we did our best to be safe, um, and if things were getting too packed or too crowded, we would, remove ourselves so we try to still be mindful while doing that mm-hmm. um how did other protesters respond to the need for safety precautions um against covid and anti-protester tactics from police those might be two kind of um uh, two different questions but um yeah they were they were kind of the same they everyone wore a mask that i saw and were trying to be as distant from each other as possible um uh um yeah i mean you still end up like clumped and stuff together but um people were still being mindful and like would pass out hand sanitizer and stuff like that um so yeah that that's how i at least i saw some like the like three or two protests that i went to that's that's kind of what i saw from those Mm -hmm. Uh, what about the anti protester tactics from like how did people respond to the need for safety precautions against the anti-protester tactics from the police wait what do you mean um so you mentioned how they were like tear gassing and um and shooting at Mm -hmm. so what what kind of ways were the the crowds of protesters preparing for uh for for those oh okay so a lot of us had like jugs of milk and like water and stuff in case anyone got tear gassed. And um, there were like first aid people there that were also protesting because they were shooting at us with rubber bullets, which can very much still kill you because they were huge. I saw one of them and I saw this guy get shot by one. Um, there was also I, this lady that was shot, shot by one and she was pregnant and it was like this whole thing and it sucked. Um, but uh, we were all like really there for each other when when that was happening. People like brought milk and water and food for the protesters because um, it was also really hot. Um, yeah. Um, okay, great. Um, I think that wraps up the questions I have for that section. Um, sorry, I don't have a great segue to the next <laughs> question, to the next group of questions. Um, but we're nearing the end. And so now I want to end kind of on a more positive note and talk a little bit more about your career and kind of your plans for the future. Um, mm-hmm. And so I uh, was going to start by asking, you know, if you can talk a little bit about how you discovered that you wanted to talk, wanted to pursue musical theater, and if you have any other stories about that that you want to share in addition to the one, maybe more recent, uh, more you know, your more recent decision to go into musical theater, but we heard that really great story about um, you starring The Little Mermaid <laughs> really little and, and you know, your your family discovering your talent. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just if you have anything else you want to add to, to uh, figuring out that career path for yourself. Yeah. Okay, so when I was little, I really liked singing and I just wanted to be a pop singer. Um, so I didn't do theater until I was a junior in high school because I remember very much telling myself when I used to watch Glee when I was like 11 I was like I don't want to do that like I don't want to I don't want to do theater are you kidding (laughs) and then I 
I realized in high school when I would just do choir, I wasn't very happy. And I was like, I don't know what it is that's not making me happy because I love singing. And I used to dance. I, I danced. I started dancing when I was like 6 to 13. But then when I was 13, I didn't like dancing anymore. Um, because I started liking singing and that was all I liked. Um, so I went to, I was in like the mission school system up until I was a junior, a sophomore in high school. And I remember going to McAllen High School and seeing their production of Susical the Musical. And I was like, I wanna do that. I wanna sing and I wanna act. I wanna do that at the same time because back at my old high school, I wasn't really getting the opportunities to do that because problems with the director, blah, 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 blah. Don't wanna get into that, but, um, uh, I remember that night I decided and I was at your house <laughs> and I remember because I went to your house, your house after Gabby and I told my mom, I was like, I think I want to move. And she was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, I, I want to, I want to go to Mac High. Like, it seems like their choir director and their theater director really get along and I really want to do that. And she was like, if you want because i had never moved schools in my life i had just gone to the same elementary that led into the middle school that led into the high school and i decided i just wanted to do that so my mom let me and i was moving to mac high with no really no friends at all there at mac high but i eventually made some and then i remember my junior year i auditioned for a year in town which was my first musical and i played pennywise um and I got into it and I booked booked that role and it was literally, I was so happy. I was so, so happy and I realized this is what I want to do. It was just kind of impulsive. There wasn't really anything sentimental behind it. I just kind of knew that I really wanted to do this. And then my senior year, I did um, Nina and in the Heights, which is like still one of the most memorable like roles I've played, even though it was a high school role. Um, and I didn't realize how uh, huge the musical theater college community was or how hard it was to get into certain programs, especially Texas State. Um, um, because usually people audition for like 10 programs at a time where I like auditioned for two because I also didn't have the money or resources to um, fly everywhere and go to callbacks and stuff. But thankfully, I got into Texas State and it was the best decision of my life, literally. I remember the day that I got into the program, um, I was with all of our family and I got the call from Caitlin and she told me that I got in and I have never felt that much, I've never felt so euphoric. Like it was the best day of my life because I wanted it so bad and I'd worked for it so bad, so much. And when I got into that program, it was like, great. And I will never regret ever auditioning for this program or getting into it because it has literally changed my life, changed my group of friends, changed my entire outlook on my life completely. It has changed me as a person 100%. Like, I now am who I have always wanted to be. Just, like, personally, like, now, like, just this upcoming year, I've like found myself truly and it is because of all the things that led up to me coming into this program and doing musical theater. And I know I want to do it as a career and I don't know where it's going to take me after like when I'm, you know, 60 and can't really work on Broadway anymore, but um, then I can teach, whatever. Um, but I just like, something in me has just, just always told me that I was supposed to be doing this. Like it was first with singing and then it was like dancing and then back to singing. But then when I started doing musicals, that's when it really locked in. And I was like, oh, this is what it is. Now I'm doing singing, dancing, and acting. And it's all I wanted. I wanted all them, all those three together. That's what I wanted. And um, I'm like really rambling, but <laughs> that's really, really, really like how it came to be. It, it was literally because I moved schools to, Mac I moved to Mac High because I saw Susical the Musical. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and just for um, context, um, since this is for documentation purposes, um, the relationship between me, the interviewer, and the interviewee is that uh, we are cousins. <laughs> just so that makes sense for why you'd be at my house. Yeah. Um, so, uh, really quickly before I move on to the other questions, uh, will you talk a little bit more about what the college audition process was like? Because you mentioned how you didn't, uh, you didn't apply for as many programs as mm -hmm. going into this you know, yeah. very specific field usually do. So um, 
there's a lot of like top notch musical theater programs. There's like Michigan Musical Theater. There's Texas State Musical Theater. There's Carnegie Mellon, Bra ba Baldwin Wallace. They're all from they're all in different states, and they're usually like the big musical theater schools that people really want to get into. So like thousands of kids auditions for these programs every year. So at first, usually, I'm pretty sure it's changed a little bit since I um, got in, but. You send a pre-screen on Get Accepted or whatever platform, whatever website that these schools have you send auditions to. And you usually have to do like two songs, two contrasting styles. So like maybe a le legit song and then a contemporary, like a pop rock. And it's usually like a 32 bar cut, which is around a minute of a song. 32 bar cut, that's like the amount of measures that you, that are in the, the song cut. And then you send a monologue and, um like a combo some some programs send you a combo to do and then you send it back but for texas state you kind of just make up your own and texas state also has a wild card video that you can send in so you can send in like maybe you like drawing or maybe you talking about where you grew up and you also write an essay so you send that that's a pre-screen and then the director the head of the program will decide if they want to call you back for on-campus audition or not so you will get an email like, oh, well, you're invited to a callback. You have to schedule your callback. Then you have to come on campus. Um, Texas State and all these big musical theater programs have on-campus callbacks. And they also attend Unifieds, um, which is like a, a huge like kind of audition convention where all of the big musical theater programs go to, either in Chicago or in New York. Um, so Caitlin Hopkins, who's the head of our program, um, usually goes to Unifieds or our dance teacher or some of our faculty go and they'll decide who they want to um, submit into the program. So I call back, which I got, I got a call back. I came to on campus and they give you a tour of the school. They show you all about the program. And that's when I really <laughs> fell in love with it because I knew, I knew I had to go here. Um, but that was obviously a big dream because out of like, I don't know, 1,000 to 2,000 kids, they only pick four, 12 to 14 per class. Uh, so at first I was on the waiting list and then I got in. And so I was in the 14 that were picked for my class. Um, but it's a really challenging um, task to do when you're auditioning musical theater programs, especially when you're auditioning for a bunch because you have to expect a bunch of rejection uh, and a lot of stress and a lot of heartbreak. Um, but yeah, I, I knew I was going to come here anyway and try to be a production and performance major and try to still get into some musical theater classes if Caitlin let me, but luckily I got in. Um, so I'm really grateful that that happened. I really think the stars really aligned when I got into this program because I, I told myself if I didn't get in that I didn't really know if I wanted to do this because I obviously wanted to do this, but I felt like me getting in was just a sign to keep pushing and to actually keep striving to do it so yeah yeah especially because it's it's such a competitive um field if, especially yeah classes that are so small between mm -hmm. two people like that's and you know after thousands of people are auditioning but actually that's a great segue into um uh something that we talked about during a pre-interview last week um uh Oh, um, I wanted to like kind of address how the average musical theater student comes from a, you know, kind of more upper middle class, upper class mm -hmm. economic background. Um, and so maybe just hear your perspective on that and um, yeah, how, how it informs their, their experience of, of the same program or even, you know, just that same audition process that really completes yeah. the audition process. Yeah, I um, did not grow up with a lot of money, so I never had, um, it, it's a lot of money to audition for musical theater programs because you have to travel if you get callbacks. So I had also auditioned for another school, it was Syracuse in New York, and I couldn't go to the callback in person, so that's kind of what shut me off from that program because I couldn't fly to New York because I didn't have the money for it. But um, a lot of people that go into musical theater, uh, have a lot of like generational wealth. I don't want to um, generalize that, but like a, a lot of people that I know that are in musical theater do, at least in personal experience. Cause I know there's also kids like me who are still like trucking out there and working and booking. Um, 
but um, it's really hard when you don't have as much money because you don't have those privileges and you, you can't uh, just, you know, pay for tuition out of pocket or anything, um, really. Not saying that everyone does that because people still get scholarships and everything and they earn those. Uh, um, but I had to, I get scholarships and I get financial aid, so because I can't really pay for two, I wouldn't be able to go here if I <laughs> didn't get those. Um, and a lot of my financial aid refund goes towards my rent. Luckily, I get um, a refund because then that it really helps with my rent. So that's kind of how I've been living. And it's really hard to get a job while you're a musical theater major, especially if you're in shows. I've been in one show every year. Um, so that's taken up like most of my time. And then last semester, when I was supposed to get a job, I COVID hit the world. So, um, I have had a job. I've never, it's not like I've been unemployed all my life, but, um, I usually have to do that either during the summer or during breaks because other than that, I'm too busy. Um, but yeah, it's definitely been a struggle and I know I'm going to, um, it, it's going, it's going to be, it's just going to take me working harder than um i intended to especially when i graduate and i move to new york uh but yeah caitlin is always there to help me she has helped me so much with that she's always there for me um she helps us all get regular jobs in new york too um uh, not very many of us are unemployed once you get like in the seven days we uh, our alumni have moved to New York, they've gotten a regular job, because it's also easier to get a job in New York, just like a regular day job. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's definitely stressful, but I'm going to try my hardest to just work through that and um, do what I want to do. Awesome. Um, we also talked about, last week during the pre-interview, we talked about how, you know, being in this kind of quote-unquote Zoom university situation um, has afforded connections with Broadway writers and actors that you wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn mm -hmm. from pre-COVID. So just uh, can you kind of like contextualize that and tell us a little bit yeah. about that? Yeah. So over Zoom, Caitlin Hopkins also has a lot of connections, obviously, because she's a Broadway vet and like she uh, worked in TV and film too. Um, so she has a lot of connections and she thankfully um, connects us to those people. So we've had a lot of Zoom master classes that we wouldn't have been able to have if it weren't for like us having to go online. So just this past like four weeks, for the past like four Fridays, I've worked with um, Andy Blankenbuehler, who is the um, choreographer of Hamilton in the Heights um, bandstand. Um, he's won Tony Awards for those. Um, uh, so we got to work with him. He taught us to dance. He taught us like four different combos for the past four Fridays. And we got to talk to him and um, that was really fun. We also had a master class with Susan Stroman, so we had a Q&A. Um, she's also a Broadway choreographer. Also, um, uh, um, sorry, I just went blank. <laughs> um, we just worked with um, Adam Quinn, who is the associate director of Dear Van Hansen on Broadway, and Jared Goldsmith, who pre-COVID was... Um, playing Jared in Dear Van Hansen on Broadway. They're like best friends. And we had like a whole musical workshop um, where we workshopped a new musical with them, which is gonna stream on Monday actually, <laughs> that I got to be in. I got to play Mysterio. And making those connections has been really cool because we befriend them and we have those connections once we go out to, into the um, industry and stuff. And we met Adam because the first time he came to Texas State pre-COVID was when him and Tara Rubin's casting office, which is the, the office that casts Dear Evan Hansen um, and other Broadway shows, um, they came to Texas just to audition us uh, for replacement calls for Dear Evan Hansen. Because usually um, uh, when, you're, when you're auditioning for replacements and stuff like that, like even though even if you're not right for that job, they'll still keep you on file. So that's always a cool thing to get in front of someone like that because they'll think of you later on and then they can call you for uh, for something else if they think of you for another project. So it was really cool to just like get in front of get in front of them. Um, and we've also met with like um, talent agencies like CGF and they come and do Q and A's and we get to meet them and just like introduce ourselves. We've had a masterclass with Eric Lieberman who um, was in Hunchback, uh, which was really cool. That was a really cool masterclass. Um, we have masterclasses with Megan Larch. Um, 
yeah, it's just been a really cool experience because I've gotten to meet all these industry professionals because they come to campus because they know that Texas State is great and they want to work with Caitlin's kids, us. Um, and that's just been a really cool experience, especially now, now that, I mean, it sucks that COVID is happening, but these Zoom master classes have been cool because we get to meet all these really freaking, like our idols, literally. Like Andy Blank and Bueller, are you kidding? I did In the Heights my senior year and I it's come full circle because my senior year of college, I am now having a master class with the original choreographer of In the Heights, which is insane. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's definitely, there's definitely pros to um, what's been happening with our current online situation. Yeah, those are really cool um, stories. Thank you for sharing those. <laughs> of course. Um, what are your plans for after graduation next summer? And how have those plans, you know, how have those plans changed, changed due to COVID? <laughs> mm -hmm. So they haven't changed. I'm <laughs> moving to New York no matter what. Um, after I graduate, it might delay a little bit now so I can make more money. Um, but I just know that like if showcase doesn't really happen, like we're still able to get signed online if um, an agent wants us after seeing our stream showcase if it doesn't happen in person. But it's changed in some good ways because I think now I get to adapt to the city more than I would have if I just had to rush in because usually after showcase if you get called in for replacements and stuff then you have to go 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 and like you're trying to handle booking a Broadway show or a tour while you're trying to move in and adapt to the rush that is New York um so I think now it's really gonna help um since Broadway is still shut down um, to move there because prices are also cheaper and uh, I get to just get a normal job and just um, kind of settle in to New York rather than go, 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 because I quite literally cannot. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's definitely what has changed with my plans. What, um, just for context, um, what is happening with the Broadway industry itself? Like, how are they handling COVID shutdown? So, it's currently shut down, so there's no shows running. It's been the longest shutdown, I think, in history. Um, um, so, Broadway's currently dark, so there's no one really working. All the actors are unemployed, even though we're still working on projects by ourselves. Um, but yeah, that's currently what's happening. It's going to be shut down until June 2021, but we're thinking that's going to last a little bit longer if things aren't looking up by then. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just to wrap it up and kind of bring it back to, you know, how, um, I don't know, yeah, maybe not to generalize that most people in the industry, but um, a lot of your peers uh, or many of your peers come from a different like socioeconomic background. Um, how does that kind of inform their experience of COVID and um, post-graduation plans and how they differ from your own? So I think, um, yeah, not to generalize because I, I don't want to, but um just people in general with more money, especially with musical theater, like moving to New York isn't, of course it's still expensive, but it isn't as, um, uh, how do I put this? It's, it's still a, it's a tiny bit easier because you still have that like um, financial support from your parents still, whereas like compared to some people who don't because um, their parents don't earn as much money, which sucks. I think we're all, we're all obviously struggling in our own ways during this pandemic. Um, in different ways, no matter like, you know, how much money you get from your parents, but um, it, there is there is a difference that I have seen, like, it's just a little easier for people to move, like, they have a higher range for, like, their rent prices and stuff, um, and can, like, move to other areas in New York, um, or, like, nicer places, just because they have that, like, more support, which I wish I had that, <laughs> um, not saying that that's a bad thing, um, but yeah, that's like the main difference that I've that I've realized. They have just have more to fall back on. Okay, wonderful. I think that wraps it up for the kind of um, you know you specific questions. So now I'm just gonna wrap up with some final questions, some standard final questions. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that about your life. Of course, and allowing it to be part of a project that gets to record it <laughs> for documentation. Of course. Um, so for these final questions, um, are you satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in Hidalgo and Hayes, Hayes, is it Hayes, Hayes counties? Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> uh, just because 
Um, I think it all still also goes back to our governor of like Texas and how he's handled um, not having full lockdowns and stuff like that. And it's not entirely enforced because we see the effects of like enforcing actual like fines and stuff like, you know, places like other countries that um, are close to having zero COVID um, like Australia and stuff like that. New Zealand, even though they are smaller, of course, I'm not going to ignore that, but um you you can just see the difference between America and like Texas specifically with other states and other countries and yeah not very satisfied hoping that uh, that gets fixed um move to the punch again because my next question is going to be are you satisfied with the state response to COVID led by Governor Abbott um, <laughs> no <laughs> are you satisfied with the national response to COVID-19 led by President Trump and his administration no <laughs> not at all because uh he um didn't handle well at all because he also wasn't enforcing mask wearing none of that which led people all of his followers um you know little cult followers to believe that you know he's always in the right so i think that really led to more of a spread of the disease mm -hmm. Um, if you had the power to respond to COVID-19, what would you do it differently, if anything? <laughs> I think I would just enforce uh, more of a lockdown. Um, you obviously don't want to like take people's rights away, all that, but um, I think there should also be like fines and like requirements for like staying home or mask wearing in public or just like more sanitary things to do if like people do have to go to jobs and stuff and also um, bigger, you know, stimulus checks and stuff like that because if you don't provide, then how are people going to get money to pay their rent and stuff like that? Um, yeah, that's just along the lines what I would what I would have done. This is a special year in our national democracy because it's a presidential voting year. Um, did you vote? And if so, did you notice or do anything different because of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, I did vote. And I early voted because there was less people. And we had an early vote uh, station here at the Performing Arts Center. And there was like little social distancing um, things. Uh, so that was different because I wasn't like waiting in a long line packed full of people. I chose to go on a day where like not really anyone was there, but yeah. Did you, uh, which county did you vote in? Hayes. Um, so the final question is, is there anything else you would like to share with me about your experiences with COVID-19 that I have not asked about? Anything um, else you want to talk about? I think we covered, I think we covered all of it. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Wow, okay, thank you so much for your time. Um, of course. You are very, very busy, so I really appreciate this, um, that you set time aside to uh, work on this project with me. Like I mentioned, you were the first person I thought of um, because I think you, your perspective is really unique and powerful. And um, yeah, thank you again for working on this with me. I'm really grateful and honored that we could do it together. Thank you so much for letting me do this. Okay, bye. Bye! <laughs>